talk to you about uh, fraud detection using active learning. And this is work that's been done uh, together with uh, Sulio uh, at Mudano, which is a financial uh, consultancy specializing in machine learning and uh, data. So what I'll talk about is uh, fraud detection and what people have done traditionally, so expert systems. Then I'll move on to talk a little bit more about active learning, which is just a rebranding of some of the older statistical concepts that I'm sure some of my colleagues here will tell me about. Uh, then I'll uh, discuss autoencoders and how they can be used in the context of anomaly detection, and then present uh, a novel methodology for detecting fraud. Uh, and then at the end talk also between area under the precision recall curve versus area under the ROC curve, and how when the data sets are extremely imbalanced, one of those two is better. Uh, so fraud is typically extremely uncommon. So most transactions or most of the data that's incoming is non-fraudulent, whereas only a very small proportion is uh, fraudulent. Uh, types of fraud change over time. So fraudsters try to adapt to whatever uh, system we put that's trying to prevent the fraud from happening. So model drift is extremely important in this domain. And generally speaking, there is too much data to label all the data using uh, human uh, subject matter experts. So we'll need to do some kind of intelligent labeling to select only the cases where it's actually important. And uh, there are two types of uh, error. So one of them is false negatives, one of them is false positives. People generally care much more about the false negatives because it's very important to not miss any cases of fraud because those are both uh, costly in terms of regulatory costs, rectification costs, and reputation costs. Uh, and false positives is something that's much easier to measure. So uh, unfortunately, people often tend to focus on uh, false positives and reducing those. So here's a traditional uh, fraud detection pipeline. So this is based on expert systems. This, people have used this for many decades. First, there will be some statistical rules that are generated using uh, subject matter experts and analysts working together. And uh, these rules will select things like, for example, if it's credit cards, maybe is the transaction above 10,000 pounds? If it is, then have a human check if it's fraudulent or not. Uh, then this goes to a human analyst in, f in the form of alerts. These alerts need to be actioned. Alerts normally take somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes to action by a human expert. And uh, then if the human analyst thinks that these uh, alerts are possibly fraudulent, they'll escalate them to cases. And then these cases are handled by fraud experts that might do some uh, field work or escalation with authorities or just some much more detailed analysis. Uh, and the time span for, for this last stage can be uh, very variable. So what people typically do is they have a good, generally a good set of rules that have some thresholds. And maybe twice a year, let's say, they might try to update those thresholds such that they improve alert to case ratio. Now, the way it's done normally uh, has a problem that you're only focusing on what your rules are already capturing. You're not observing any of the rest of the space that is not captured by your current rules. So it's very hard to come up with new rules. So generally speaking, it's mostly threshold adjusting, trying to reduce the amount of false positive alerts while not losing any of the false negative alerts. There's another problem with this, which is to do with uh, not having necessarily always a training and testing split and doing this uh, in the most rigorous way. So what I propose is a slightly different uh, fraud detection pipeline, where we are inserting another step, which is the active learning step here. And then we can arbitrarily relax the rules. So this step can basically be nothing, or we can decide to uh, look only at transactions greater than 1,000 pounds or something that, that will pass through more data. And the active learning step, the algorithm we propose, is the iteratively retrained autoencoder that I'll describe in details uh, in, a, in a bit. So I want to talk a little bit more about the traditional fraud detection. What are the main problems? So the traditional fraud detection pipeline mostly consists of uh, false positive alerts. So usually something like only one in 50 cases. So well, one in 50 alerts will result in a case. Uh, and uh, that's partly due to properties of uh, rules that 
generally, if you don't want to have any false negatives fall through, you have to have quite a lot of false positives or a lot of rules, uh, which are harder to maintain. These traditional approaches, uh, generally speaking, are very slow to adapt to new types of fraud because you will need to have some other way of discovering those false negatives because you don't have any random exploration element or you don't look at how does the data differ. And as I said, the old transactions cannot be labeled. So we need to do something, something about that. So how can we get more supervision into our model? So the traditional approach would be to use subject matter experts to label all the data and then train a supervised learning algorithm on top of that. Unfortunately, that is impractical in this case because the volume of data is too high and it's too expensive. What people have tried to do is uh, something like called a weak supervision where uh, humans may come up with a special set of rule-based systems that are trying to obtain labels cheaper. But the problem is that even no matter how complex your algorithm is, you may find that these rules just tend to learn the heuristic itself that generated the rules. <coughs> Uh, another approach is using transfer learning, which works extremely well in some domains. Uh, here, what, what you do is you train a model on another problem where you have a lot of label data, and then you try to use that problem for, to solve your own task. But unfortunately, this introduces some of the bias from the difference of the two tasks. Uh, and another approach is, uh, type of approach is uh, using semi-supervised learning where you're using structural assumptions of the unlabeled data to decide which labels you'd like to look at and active learning is doing exactly that so it's using subject matter expert humans to label some of the data that is most interesting to be labeled such that it improves the performance of the algorithm in terms of both false negatives and false positives so what is active learning so I like to call it, it's a hybrid between semi-supervised learning and reinforcement learning because there is an element of selection and deciding which labels you want to select to be labeled. Then you need to wait for some time, get those labels back. And what, what you care about is the long-term performance of the system, the stability of the system, and how much fraud does it actually detect at what cost. And the key idea is that you can achieve the uh, MPAR performance with supervised learning with many, many fewer labors, uh, labels. Uh, and uh, the important thing is what intuitively active learning tries to focus on is sampling uncertain areas of the space and sampling dense areas of the space. Uh, why dense areas of the space? Because in those areas you'll have a lot of possible mass. So you may not care about the uncertain area of the space that occurs extremely rarely. And why uncertain areas of the space? Because those will, generally speaking, inform your classifier the most. Uh, the advantage of active learning is that it's quickly adaptable to uh, new different types of data. So if suddenly our transactions start looking very different, the algorithm will focus on looking at those because those are going to be the uncertain areas of the space because they'll look different than the data has looked so far. Some popular active learning strategies from other domains so one of them is uncertainty sampling. Here, you're focusing on labeling the points where the certainty of the model is the lowest. So the intuition behind this is that that way you are increasing the certainty of the model. Uh, another approach is uh, expected error reduction, where you're trying to label points that will uh, minimize your loss on the held out validation set. The problem with this method is that you will need to uh, re recreate your uh, train test split many times and unless it's a streaming case, in which case you may be able to keep getting new data to look at. Another one is expected model change, where you try to select, the, to label the points which will most change how the model is uh, structured. So if there is a point that if it was to be labeled uh, in one particular way or another particular way, what would the change to the model need to be to adjust for that? Another one is uh, balancing exploitation and exploration. So this is, generally speaking, contextual bandits. So here you're trying to optimize for both exploiting, uh, so trying to select the points which are most uh, fraudul likely to be fraudulent, and also trying to explore the data, so areas that are uncertain. And query by committee is sim similar to uncertainty sampling. So here you may have multiple different methods, and you try to label the points where most of those classifiers disagree 
I'd like to talk about autoencoders and how they can be used to detect anomalies and how they can be used in fraud. So first, what do autoencoders do? They're a self-supervised method where you have some inputs, then you, you compress them into a smaller representation space, and then you'd like to recover the original inputs out. Now, why, why is this uh, possibly useful for the domain of fraud detection? <coughs> well, by compressing the data, you'll lose some information, and you're forcing the model to get rid of the unlikely data, data or noisy data points. So it's trying to capture some general structural properties of which apply to most of the data. And to make it work for the fraud detection case, there are two assumptions. One, that amount of fraud is negligible, which is generally the case. So because it's negligible, the autoencoder will not have the capacity to try to learn the structure of the fraudulent data. And the second one is that the fraudulent data looks different than the non-fraudulent data. Uh, which is important because the model will then learn to maximize 99% of, of the data to try to recover it as well as possible, whereas it may choose to ignore the 1% of the fraudulent cases or less. I'm going to focus on the credit card fraud detection data set, which, which is freely available. It was released by uh, World La Worldline. Uh, it uh, consists of European transactions over two days from about three years ago, and the fraud uh, the frauds are extremely uncommon, so only about one in 800 uh, data points will be fraudulent, and this is fairly common for fraud data sets. And uh, the features available are time, the amount of the transaction cost, and the first 30 PCA components, and this was done to, to anonymize the data set. So the first simple methodology that I want to propose is we use a, an unsupervised or a semi-supervised approach to select a certain number of data points that are most anomalous. Then we label those anomalous data points, and then we train a supervised classifier on those anomalous data points. So that's going to be a subset of all the data, and what we would hope is to approach as close as possible to the supervised learning performance on all the data points. And I'd like to now talk about the iteratively retrained uh, autoencoder. So this is the method that has achieved the best performance on this domain that we've developed, as far as I can tell. So the idea is to label a small batch of points, let's say 50 data points, uh, using the highest reconstruction loss using the autoencoders. Then we train a supervised classifier on these uh, 50 data points. And we select the 50 next data points that haven't been labeled yet which are most likely to be fraudulent. And then we repeat the process. Now we go back to the autoencoder, but this time modifying the loss function so that uh, the labeled data points will have a higher weight and fraudulent data points will actually have an inverse cost. So now suddenly what we are saying is that for the fraudulent data points, we are happy to have as high reconstruction error as possible, whereas for labeled non-fraudulent data points, we want to have a, as low a reconstruction error as possible and more so than any of the unlabeled data points. So this way, what we are doing is we're kind of physically trying to reshape the space that's captured by the autoencoders, such that the fraudulent data points don't fit very well the model. So we're trying to learn the model of the points which are non-fraudulent, which need to fit better. And then we keep repeating this process with a small patch size. So what are the results? So here, we can see the performance of an unsupervised uh, K-means algorithm, which is somewhere around 20% uh, area under the precision recall curve. I'll talk about that in a moment, the metric use. And uh, the line at the top is the supervised upper bound performance. So this is when all the data points are labeled. So we simulated different uh, selection strategies. One of them is the random selection strategy. So because we know that only one in about 800 points is fraudulent, the performance is extremely low for a long time until we hit upon one or two data points data points that are fraudulent, and then the performance goes up. <coughs> Another algorithm is uh, the k-means. So we are simply selecting the data points that k-means has fit the worst. So for example, to obtain this data point, this is selecting 1,000 data points uh, using the k-means algorithm, labeling those data points, and then training a supervised learning algorithm on top of those data points. And the red line at the top is the iteratively retrained uh, autoencoder, and as we can see, it uh, tends to outperform all the other methods at every 
uh, number of labeled data points. And as we approach to 10,000 data points, we seem to have uh, reached the peak performance of the supervised algorithm. So by labeling only about 1% of all the data points, we can achieve uh, near equivalent performance to the supervised learning algorithm. So we use the area under the precision recall curve to report the results. So why is that? So because the data set is extremely imbalanced, uh, there are two different metrics people may use to report if you're not choosing a specific threshold. So one of them is area under the ROC curve, where you're plotting the false positive rate against the false uh, false negative rate, and uh, sorry, the true positive rate against the false positive rate, and then you're looking at the area under this curve. And the other method is using the precision recall curve, where you're plotting the precision and recall uh, for every point on your uh, using every threshold of your model. And uh, note that uh, recall is simply the true positive rate, so these two graphs are fairly similar, but there is one key distinction, that the false positive rate is comparing the false positives to true negatives, whereas the precision is comparing the false positives to true positives. And because the dataset is extremely imbalanced, there are going to be many, many more true negatives than uh, true positives. So let's see that with an example. So here we have uh, two methods, method A and method B. And looking at the area under the uh, ROC curve, the two curves seem very similar to me. So there doesn't seem to be a clear preference over one curve over another. And looking at the area under the ROC curve, method A seems to slightly uh, overperform against the area under the curve for method B. But when we look at the area under the precision recall curve, we see a completely different picture. So here we see that area under the precision recall curve is about four times lower in method A than in method B. So why does this happen? Let's look at one particular data point. So let's look at what happens at the true positive rate of 50%, or rather at the recall of 50%. What happens at that point? So in the ROC uh, curve, that point is compared against the false positive rate. So the amount of false positive is going to be extremely large. So, uh, so on this curve, these two points are very, very near to each other. And on this curve, what we're seeing is that the precision at the recall 50 is only about 20%. So what that means is that one in five points at the recall of 50 will be uh, correctly classified as fraud, whereas four out of five will not be correctly classified as fraud. Whereas in method B, at the recall of 50, we'll still have 100% precision, which means that we're only capturing fraudulent data points. So an example with the numbers, so again, the two methods. So let's say that we have one million transactions, out of which 100 transactions are fraudulent. So it's a highly imbalanced problem. We have method A that flags ten, uh, 100 transactions, and 90 of those are correctly identified as fraud, and method B flags 2,000 transactions, out of which 90 of them are correct. So if we uh, see what happens with the area under the ROC curve, the difference is extremely small in absolute terms, and area under the precision recall curve, the difference is extremely large when looking at the curve. And the, the intuitive reason why that is the case is because in one case we're comparing uh, 100 divided by 1 million versus 2,000 divided by 1 million. So in absolute terms, there is a very small difference between the two. Whereas uh, with area under the precision recall curve, we're comparing to 100 divided with uh, 90 and 2,000 with 90. And 2,000 with 90 is much worse in terms of the ratio, as you can see here. To summarize, uh, we have shown how active learning can be used instead of the traditional expert systems to, uh, in, within fraud detection. And we introduced a novel uh, method, iteratively retrained autoencoders, which outperformed all the other approaches we've tried. And we showed that with using only about, by labeling only about 1% of all the data points, we can achieve uh, parity with supervised learning, which labels all the data points. And uh, we managed to show that the false positive rate is reduced by at least a factor of 10 compared <coughs> to the traditional methods. And this method is more adaptable to new data and actually misses a fewer false negatives. And uh, finally, the area under the precision recall curve is the method 
to use rather than area under the ROC curve if your data set is extremely balanced. I hope I managed to convince you of that. So these are my references, and uh, do you have any questions? <laughs>